Thank you for joining us and welcome to this edition of Liz Collin Reports, a place for truth and meaningful Minnesota conversations. On the podcast, we're excited to welcome Matt Burke, who hopes to be Minnesota's next lieutenant governor, the running mate of Dr. Scott Jensen. Thanks for being here, Matt. Thanks for having me. Nice to finally meet you and get a chance to talk to you. I kind of wanted to First, talk about how you're feeling at this point, a progress report. I know you've been crisscrossing the state, been very busy, but what do you think? A little more than 100 days to go. Yeah, I feel great. I mean, the reception that we're getting all across the state is very positive. And I just think at the end of the day, Minnesotans have had enough and uh, and they want what the basic things that the government should be providing them, such as safe streets, good schools, a healthy economy. And uh, I think even people who haven't traditionally been on the right side of the aisle are, are, are seeing the light and seeing that we do need a, a change, a change of philosophy, and also a change of leadership in this state. Polls do seem to suggest that this race is really a dead heat at, at this point. And are you hearing from a lot of DFLers who, who crossed the line, or maybe people in, who've been more in the middle before, who you think will go red this time? Absolutely. You know, I think historically, I mean, Minnesota, right? Like, what are we as Minnesotans? Well, we're nice. We're very passive aggressive. Are we? Are we nice? Uh, okay. Well, I, we like to think <laughs> that we're yourself. nice. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and it's just like, well, we just vote Democrat. You know, like I grew up, my parents were blue dog Democrats. That was the that was the party of, of the working class back then. Uh, but that's not the case today. And so I think there are a lot of people who traditionally sort of identified as 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 Democrats. Uh, uh, their eyes have been opened, especially the last couple years with everything that's happened with our country and the, and the, and the political climate and the conversation around, around politics. And, uh, and a lot of people are saying, you know, I've never, never voted Republican before, but I am voting Republican. Uh, a lot of people, uh, teachers, a lot of people who are, who are in the, the labor unions, you know, traditionally just staunch Democrat fall in line voters. Uh, we, we, we've heard from a lot of those people and they're, and they're coming to our side. What do you think? I want to ask you a few things um, going on in the news right now. First, your take on the ruling uh, that recently came out, uh, striking down most of Minnesota's abortion restrictions. Do you think that this will put women at risk? I do. I do. I don't think that's. Uh, I don't think that's protecting women. You know, to uh, to say that now a physician does not have to perform uh, second or third trimester abortions in a hospital. Uh, to not have the waiting period, to not have the uh, minors to get consent from their parents. Um, you know, I think that's just sort of a, an overreaction from, uh, from, from the left as to the, to the Roe v. Wade ruling. And so I think, that's, I think that's really unfortunate. But I think overall in Minnesota, what's, what I think is really interesting and exciting um, is in, in November 8th, abortion is not on the ballot in Minnesota. You know, we have Dovey Gomez, okay? And everybody knows that I'm a staunch pro-life advocate and Scott Jensen uh, is pro-life. But Dovey Gomez is there. So November 9th, nothing's gonna change. But what we get to, what enables in Minnesota is us to have a conversation. And really, let's have a conversation. How do we build a system that better supports women who are unexpectedly pregnant? Um, you know, what, what, what can we do? Versus this just being a political issue, but, but how can we really put, put women at the center along with their babies? And, you know, I mean, I'm not really, at the end of the day, I'm not really that interested in jamming this type of legislation down people's throats. I think I speak for a lot of pro-life advocates who say we, we'd, we'd really love, the ultimate goal is to change people's hearts and minds. So, so we don't need abortion. And, 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 and what does that look like? And let's have, a, let's have a conversation, let's put everything on the table, Republicans and Democrats. And, what would that system look like? So we, so we, don't, so we don't need abortion, or we certainly don't need it to the, uh, to the extent that we have it now. How about what happened on the 4th of July in Minneapolis about this ongoing crime and, and chaos? I know you guys have been very outspoken about, but what will, what can the governor's office do if, if you two uh, you know, were, were to hold office? I think first and foremost, create a, a, a culture of law and order. You know, I think what we've seen from the, from the, from the riots in 2020 since is that Tim Walls and Peggy Flanagan have d done nothing to, uh, to promote or, or, or to support law enforcement. Uh, in fact, they've, uh, they've, they've emboldened uh, criminals to, to sort of think that they can pretty much do uh, whatever they want. So, I mean, obviously, we need more cops on the streets. But I think, I think cops need to be supportive. I think a big reason why we have a shortage now is they don't feel like they're supported by leadership. Uh, and that's and that's really unfortunate. I mean, now we have the citizens, even the citizens of North Minneapolis, filing a lawsuit against the Minneapolis City Council, saying you're not living up to to what you're required to do in your charter. You don't have enough police on the streets. I mean, people want to people want to be safe. They deserve to be safe. Uh, that would be number one is is enforcement. And then number two is 
uh, when when criminals are arrested, uh, we need to we need to keep them in jail. Minnesota has the third lowest incarceration rate in the country, in the country. You know, I mean that's I mean so I mean I don't think you have to be a a rocket scientist or a law enforcement expert to see why Minnesota is now a high crime state. Our crime is above the national average. And just to ask people, does that seem like Minnesota to you? In my lifetime, in your lifetime, I don't think Minnesota's ever been a high crime rate. That's one of the things we pride ourselves on is being a, a big, safe metropolitan area, but that's no longer the case. On education, I know that you recently spoke to our columnist, Karen Sullivan, uh, on this, but she wrote about some of your views. You're the co-founder of a school. I know have eight children, so you're an educator constantly. <laughs> a lot of experience <laughs> at schools. So I have a lot of kids. <laughs> exactly. But you talked about, in that piece, believing more in character building at school rather than finger pointing, but explain that. Well, I mean, right, so school, what, like, what's, like, what's the goal? Like, like, what are we supposed to do? Martin Luther King has a great simple quote, which he has a lot of them, but he said, knowledge and character, that is the true goal of education, right? I think character wins in life. I think um, as a society, we should be trying to instill character and values into our kids. And there are some things that are universal, regardless of which political party or which, or, or, or which religion we are. Uh, trying to teach kids to be to be good people, to be able to identify, you know, these these character traits, character strengths, um, and see those in themselves. But then also see those in other people, right? I mean, we all do a great job, and kids especially trying to point out people's faults. But there's there's actually a scientific framework called positive psychology that has kind of studied every single civilization since the beginning of time and said, what do they hold up as as character, meaning the good in people? And uh, we're able to find these 24 character strengths. And I think, you know, we could, we could all, everybody could get behind those and as something that we should be instilling in our, in our young people versus I think some of the, uh, I'll call it divisive curriculum that we see in, in a lot of our public schools. And, and on that note, you know, you're able to start your own school and we have this private school route, but is that your message for people in, in public school that this can, can be done? Oh, it absolutely can be done. We're not the only ones doing it. And I think if you look throughout education the last 20 years, um, it looks a lot different than it did 40 years ago. There's lots of different types of schools, charter schools, private schools, home schools and co-ops. You know, and I think what we've really learned is that there's really no one size fits all when it comes to education. And so what Dr. Scott Jensen and I want to do is, is even open up, open up the choice. So parents are the primary educators of their kids. They know what their kids need. They know their kids best. And they should really be able to send them to any school uh, that, they, that they feel is, is fit and best uh, for their kid and not, and not confine them to a certain public school or a, or a certain number of public schools. What we do know, and then data does not lie, is that over the last few years, spending keeps going up in public education, but the proficiency scores keep going down. And so, you know, the goal is not to, or, or the end is not public education as it is today. The end is to educate children. That's what it is. And so you can set them up on a trajectory to have a, to have a great life, you know, equip them, equip them for, for the world. And so I think it's time that we brought, brought some really bold, fresh ideas to education and, and uh, other states have, have done really robust education choice programs, and what it's shown is that uh, economically it's more efficient, uh, but it's also improved the performance of students in public schools and private schools to have that healthy, healthy competition. We know that most, most families are going to go to public schools. We're not here to try to destroy those or, dis, or dismantle them, uh, but certainly I don't think anybody can look at the results right now and say that it's working well enough. You talk about fresh ideas. We heard your plan already for public safety. There's been a plan released uh, from your team about lowering gas prices in Minnesota. Now you have an energy plan you're unveiling, but talk yeah. about that. Well, you know, this energy debate is very interesting because uh, energy stability is a must. You know, this isn't just a, it's just not a nice to have. Uh, we, we need energy to be able to feed everybody in our, in our world. And, and the reason why we've been able to scale our, our food supply system to feed 8 billion people is because of fossil fuels. And I just feel like that this whole conversation got hijacked from the extreme conservationists, you know, vilifying fossil fuels and um, tapping into this green idealism that I think we all have, you know, we all, we all want to, you know, we, we all, we would love it if everything could be powered by the sun, like that would be amazing, but that's not reality. And so I think some politicians have also 
manipulated the conversation and have gone too far over to this this renewable energy side, you know, whether it's with wind and, and solar. And that's certainly, you know, we should be investing in new and certainly renewable technologies for energy. But right now, that is not going to get it done. You know, in our on our grid, the MISO grid, uh, I think solar and wind, uh, on average, account for about 4 or 5% uh, of, of all the energy. So it needs to be a balanced conversation um, because, uh, because energy is, is a must. Uh, and um, I think overall, at a high level, the, 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 convers the conservation conversation needs to focus not on, not on fossil fuels bad, renewables good, or vice versa, finding the right blend in that, but also if, if we really want to uh, preserve the earth the best we can, we, we only focus on how, how can we use less, less energy. Uh, that's, that, that's, where it, that's where it needs to go and keep developing these new technologies. But we're not there yet for everybody to be uh, driving electric cars and, and just, have, just have solar panels, panels on their houses. It's, it's not going to work. You've released this plan, the Minnesota Fitness uh, Initiative. Are you Minnesota taking Fitness part in it? Challenge. Are you well, I was going to challenge you to some sort of push-up competition. We could do that. You know, yeah, but we it, we're do that. kind of in a bad environment to, to do that right now. You've dropped a few pounds, you know, since I know your days of, in, <laughs> no. in the NFL. But I think it's it's a really interesting um, a pr approach here. To, you're engaging kids uh, in the in this challenge as well, but also to be more proactive in our health. I think um, is something that a lot, a lot of politicians don't want to talk about. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know with politicians, I think it's a lot of Americans yeah. in general, right? Pretty interesting. We're the most prosperous country in the world, right? And I think uh, I think our healthcare system is the best in a, in a lot of ways. But I think also the way that we think of healthcare is um, it, it's a little bit backwards. We're not proactive. We kind of we live in this consumerism so society, and and we just think, well, I'll just eat and drink and you know do whatever I want, and then down the road, that give me a pill to fix that. And uh, you know, we saw during COVID, right? Like. Boy, I mean, I think a lot of people probably took their health for granted. And then during COVID, it was sort of like, whoa. And there's so much we can do proactively. Um, you know, you saw I lost a lot of weight. Yeah, well, I mean, I couldn't have gained any more weight. Quite <laughs> frankly, I was maxed out at 315. Uh, but I got done playing. And, you know, I, but I was fortunate when I was, uh, when I was in middle school and high school, uh, met some people, some adults. Had some great friends who we, you know, we got into working out and developing healthy habits. And then uh, and you developed that discipline and willpower. And, uh, and that's, that's served me well uh, in, in my life a after football. And so I think it's something that we can all pay a little bit more attention to. So I wanted to kind of throw something out there that would be, that would be fun, um, that people, the young people could, could get behind. And, you know, talking about sleep, talking about drinking more water, talking about taking a break from screens, you know, maybe just, you know, Taking a break from social media, right, all good stuff. Try, yeah. try a fruit and vegetable every day and just start thinking about it. And, uh, and like I said, it's, 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 life is all about habits and especially, especially health. So let's try to, let's try to get our kids into it now. It'll, it'll pay dividends, certainly pay dividends down the road. We'll have some information on that challenge on our website, alphanews.org. And I know, so, know you guys have uh, quite a bit of information out there as well. But I think Dr. Scott Jensen is the one that actually needs to sleep more, right? Isn't he, doesn't he run off just a few hours? There, there is. He's got to he, sign up for this challenge. He's wired differently <laughs> than everybody. And I'm on him all the time about his diet. I've never seen anybody eat more sugar than this guy. Uh, I'm I don't want to say I'm concerned though, because he just goes and goes and goes, and uh, yeah, he's just you know like when I played football, we you know, like a Adrian Peterson or Randy Moss, right? We would just say those guys are just built different. Scott's just uh, he's just built different than everybody else. And you guys are really running this kind of two campaigns at once. It, you have your own logos, your own colors for each of you. But what does government look like uh, if you are occupying? Um, the, the, the governor's mansion uh, soon. Yeah, so, I mean, he's the governor, there's no doubt about it, but you look at it, it's such a big job. I think the governor has to appoint 28 commissioners, I think. How could one person be responsible for hiring 28 commissioners and 28 different people reporting them and really have any sort of, uh, of, of engagement or, 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 I mean, you know, really know what's, what's going on? And when Scott asked me to do it, my, my first question was, well, what does the lieutenant governor do? And he's like, there's really no job description. And I said, okay, well, what does it look like? And Scott's a very, uh, very humble guy. You know, uh, he, he's, I think he's built, he's been successful in a lot of areas of life of, of being th that real servant leader. And he said, hey, here are the areas where I think you know a lot more than I do, where you can lead on, you know, education, public safety, economy. Uh, I said, okay, great. And, and he really much does see it, I think, as a, as a, as, you know, a partnership. Um, and I think, I think that's, I think that's the only way you can attack this. You know, um, Lieutenant Governor can't just be a, 
some that someone that checks a box or you know someone that just uh, you know is, is is arm candy, if you will, right? I mean, I think that um, I think that, that there's a lot of work to be done, and I think that the people of Minnesota should look at that position and say, what kind of value are we going to derive from that? Because um, that person needs to they need to do some work because there's 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 plenty of work to go around. You've said before that you feel this is the year that people take the government back from politicians. You still feel like that? I do, because everywhere we go, a majority of our crowds are people that have never been involved in politics before. And whether it was you know, during COVID with, with the government overreach of closing down churches, schools, uh, businesses, whether it's uh, they don't feel safe on the streets, whatever it is, but these are like everyday citizens who have just said, all right, you know, right, I've been trying to go to work and take care of my family and do that, but enough's enough. Like I have to do something. And a, a majority of our, of our crowds are those types of people. So this truly is a grassroots movement. That's what inspired me to, to get involved and, and become Scott's running mate was I saw the movement with, with my own eyes. And I said, this is, you know, I think most of us identify as not really being that political, uh, but it was something that like, hey, I can, I can, I can get involved in this because this is, this is, uh, this is real. And as Minnesotans, we tend not to talk about our, our feelings and, and, and politics and such, but I do feel like those conversations are really at the forefront, and they weren't before. Absolutely, and I just think it's because of you know we kind of we kind of went through it and had a little bit worse than uh, than the, than the rest of the country, and I think um, kind of took it all for granted. <laughs> we did take it all for granted. Amazing, you know, we're recently with uh, Ennis Freedom, a former NBA player who has spoken out against uh, from his home country in Turkey and what's going on in China, the human rights violations and. Uh, incredible, and we as Americans, we we have taken a lot for granted. And hopefully, even though as as hard as these last few years have been, I'm hopeful that we come out of this as a as a country as a whole uh, better. That that was kind of a wake up call. That um, hey, we can't take this for granted. Even though we've we've got our our problems, it's it's never going to be perfect. This this still is the, the the greatest country on earth. Okay, and I have to ask you for flashback sake. Where does lightning come from? Where does lightning come from? Well, first we must understand the nature of atoms. Atoms are made up of positively charged protons and uncharged neutrons. This dynamic is called the electromagnetic force. Well, doesn't it come from the sky? Y yeah, yeah. Thank you. Matt Burke. He went to Harvard. I probably get asked where lightning comes from oh, one, one, once a week. That was a United Way commercial from 2002, I believe, which... Uh, which was my foray into TV commercials. I don't think I've done any since, but uh, <laughs> actually aired during during the Super Bowl. It was a great commercial. It was a great, great, great commercial. And it comes but... from the sky, by the way, Liz, in okay, case you didn't yeah, know from the sky. Yeah. Thanks for answering the question. Yeah, you're welcome. You're that, welcome. This is why you're not like a lot of politicians. You're answered. <laughs> but thank you so much, Matt. We really appreciate you being here. I know uh, your time is quite valuable, so good luck to you. My pleasure. Thanks, Liz. Again, Matt Burke joining us today. That will do it for this episode of Liz Collin Reports. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, or any other podcast platform. Give us a five-star rating. We'd be grateful. We'll see you next time.